Welcome, everybody, to the Well of Being. Um, we are delighted to be together um, this evening in presenting um, some teachings from Sukhmi Rinpoche's book, Open Heart, Open Mind. And I think happily this week, we're really focusing on the chapters of body and subtle body. I hope that that feels resonant or maybe even like a nice big exhale for you all. Um, focusing on the body as a place of refuge and focusing on the body also as a place where we can really learn about how, <laughs> what goes on in our mental and emotional realms impacts the way we feel physically on a day-to-day -day basis. So that will be uh, the theme of our time together. And we want to, you know, first of all, welcome everybody who is here, just looking at everybody's faces um, as I scroll through here and set a couple of ground rules for our time here together. Uh, many of you have been coming um, on a weekly basis and, and heard this a number of times, but really reminding us of a couple things. First of all, the core values of the San Francisco Dharma Collective that we like to uphold here together. And with the Dharma Collective, it's truly a radical space, as many of you know, being volunteer run and also being a space where uh, our aspiration and goal is that everybody feels welcome. Everybody can find here a sense of connection and belonging if that's available. So in order for us to do that, it's, it's useful to adhere to some basic qualities and principles. The ones I've been drawing on recently are actually from the Paramitas, from the spiritual qualities of how we um, can develop ourselves along the spiritual path. And when we think of these qualities, they're just not only good for us here together tonight as we're collectively gathering, they're really good and meaningful for us throughout our daily life. And they really give us a important instruction on um, how to turn towards <laughs> what is hard and use that as encouragement. So we can think of this evening coming together and, and really considering patience. And how can we show up in this environment which for many of us, at least I'll say myself, we were in front of screens all day, already. And that has its own level of drain and exhaustion. So having a patience with the fact that we don't get to be together, that sometimes this mediated technological format is annoying. We're gonna venture into the realms of breakout groups tonight. That can also have its own level of annoyance. Uh, maybe it won't work out quite way. Maybe we won't remember the instructions. So really encouraging you to work with patients as we're all here together in this uh, maybe less than ideal format. And yet, of course, we can also bring forward a quality of joyful enthusiasm to our time together, really feeling as though the great fortune that we're receiving through these teachings is palpable. To get instructions on um, how to be in our body, to get instructions on how to transform some of the blockages in our body. This is amazing. And it's really wonderful. I know there's many of you here tonight who wouldn't be here if we weren't on this online format. And so celebrating that level of Sangha that our connectedness can extend farther because of this virtual format. Mm -hmm. And I invite you lastly to really reflect on the Paramita that invites us towards non-harming to really thinking about what that means at a personal level and an interpersonal level. At the personal level, can we be gentle with ourselves? Can we, for the evening, really give some spaciousness to our experience and ease? And of course, while we are either listening to the teachings or interacting with others or sharing via chat, in our mind, can we really hold compassion and really have a sense of this is all the ingredients that I need right here to show me where I might feel a little stuck. So when we find our reactivity of maybe frustration or anxiety, to really be tender and gentle and as much as possible and as soon as we can, release any forms of subtle aggression and aversion and really take that to heart in our engagements so that we're living our practice and how we show up for it. Chandra, would you like to add anything else about our showing up here together. I really love how you talk about that. And um, I've also been thinking about the paramitas in terms of like bodhisattva 
approach to life, which is this idea that we're here to be of service, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the the six paramitas or the six perfections that Eve talks about are bodhi are a part of the teachings of bodhicitta in action. So there's two mm. categories. There's bodhicitta in aspiration, like the wish, and those are the four measurables of love, compassion, equanimity, and joy. And then there's bodhicitta yes. in action, and it's the six perfections. So it's exactly like what she's saying. How do we meet the moment? How do we mm. relate to others? How do we engage on this online forum, you know, with patience and space and compassion? And the six perfections are the... You know, there's patience, there's generosity, there's uh, discipline, so a quality of presence. You know, I'm not going to space out and go on my Instagram account while we're supposed to be meditating. <laughs> you know, there's also diligence, so there's mm. a quality of staying and being here and really commit to the long, the long haul. <laughs> and then concentration, of course, which we enact on our cushion, but also in our life, in our presence, our mindfulness throughout our day and night maybe, if you do dream yoga. And then there's the wisdom that comes from all of this, which is mm. prajna, that wisdom. And, and so these, this is, we can bring these six perfections into this arena in terms of our agreements, but we can also bring it into our, our activism, you know, our marching, our, our calling, our talking, our thinking and feeling about everything that we, we meet in our life. So I'm, I really love how you bring this into this format. Thank you. Eve. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, I think I think it's a really interesting opportunity space when we have so many alluring distractions um, because we're already on a screen. <laughs> and my invitation to you is to just be conscious in your choice. If tonight you are just depleted and what you need to do is make a big bowl of your favorite carbohydrates and listen and passively experience, go for it. If you have it in you to really show up for the teachings, stay, but fully stay, not that halfway, right? Really bring mindfulness to your decisions and the impact they will have on, on yourself and others. And um, totally okay to keep your camera off if you really need that kind of inner space and or kitchen space um, to be cooking or cleaning or doing what is really supportive of your body and your mind. Um, and if you're here with us and you can have your camera on, it's so wonderful um, and so helpful so that we can kind of see you, even if you want to put it at your profile view so you can look out, um, just to have that sense of truly togetherness. So I invite us, before we move into practice, uh, we'll be doing a practice of uh, tending towards the subtle body. I invite you all to gaze upon one another with friendliness and openness. There may be a couple screens to swipe through, but yeah, hi, and just a nice welcome. Happy to be in community with you all. Happy to be creating this uh, place of refuge as we are refueling ourselves for the important work that continues to need to be done in this world. So. Okay, so with that, one thing I, I really appreciate in this, these two chapters that Chandra and I will be covering this evening is Sokni really breaks down the importance of our posture of meditation. <clears throat> Many of you have done a lot of formal practice and probably had a lot of formal instruction in posture, but it's always a nice reminder that truly how we sit can support the attitude and inclination of the mind. So let's start at our very base and our root, whether you're sitting on a chair or on cushions, and really just get a sense of rootedness and groundedness through your feet. So making any adjustments needed that you feel as though you're in connection with the support from below. In my experience, this rootedness is not only just where the feet are touching, but really where, where the spine is touching the cushion or the chair. And having a sense, again, you might lean a little forward and lean a little back and find that place right in the middle where you feel the support rising up, rising up. And that really helps us have this quality of an upright spine. This upright spine, it's Roshi Joan Halifax often instructs us in, in times of challenge to have a strong back and a soft belly. 
And I love that teaching. So we're here affirming that strong back, that upright spine, the internal structure upon which our practice can really be fluid. And then inviting that spaciousness in the belly, feeling of groundedness. If you have any constricting clothing, giving yourself a little bit of a break there. And finding an intentional posture with your hands, whether this is laid flat on your thighs or folded in your lap. And then moving upwards to find a little space between your arms and your body in a way that allows your breath to go more freely. So together we can do this by inhaling our shoulders up to our ears, exhaling our shoulders down our back. Feel that spaciousness twice more. Inhaling our shoulders up to our ears and then exhale, rolling our shoulders back and inviting that spaciousness in the chest once more. And then letting the arms hang loosely away from the body. And moving upwards, invite a quality of gentleness through the throat. And relaxing and releasing tension throughout the muscles of the face. Especially softening behind the eyes. and inviting a gaze that's either with eyes closed or open and softly focused in front of you. So once more, alighting our attention on all the aspects of our posture, from the groundedness of our feet and our sit bones, <clears throat> to the stability and spaciousness at our belly, the intentional placement of our hands, the uprightness of our spine, and that extra level of free, freeness and fluidity with the breath, our chest feeling open, our arms slightly wider, soft and gentle through the throat, the neck, the face. And then finding the head and gaze, gently resting as though the gaze, whether eyes opened or closed, was one that felt an unplugging of the eyes, a releasing. And feeling the head resting gently, balanced evenly on top of the neck. And then feeling this posture all at once. And with the same precision that we brought to our posture, let's invite that same precision to considering our intention for practice. What is the underlying motivation for us to be here together? What matters? What do we value? This might arise very easily, community, connection. Or it might be something we really need to ask ourselves deeply inwardly. Why am I here? For what purpose? And excavate that important aspect of intention. Waking and opening the heart. See if you can connect 
a personal reason for being here, to the global reason of our shared common humanity and a global consciousness. A couple moments here, just focusing on our personal intention at this relative level of our experience and our grander, more ultimate level of intention and aspiration. And then releasing this aspiration the associated thoughts and feelings and images and inviting your attention to fully be poured into the field of tactile sensation in the body. Imagine this was the first time you noticed you had a body bring that kind of wonder, that newness and that freshness. And gently scan around this body. This scanning can be entirely without language, non-conceptual. Feeling into the experience of sensation in the body. And we transition now to this practice slightly more formally. It's called the handshake practice. And we investigate not just the level of our body in its form. Maybe we notice the warmth of our palms. Maybe we notice the heaviness of our eyelids. And that's at the level of our physical body and experience. I invite you to look at the other level the level of the body in which we can experience the emotional residue of our day, of these weeks, of these months. The level at which when a thought, memory or image arises, one that brings forth with it frustration or longing, jealousy, insecurity, we feel it in the body. It arises not only as a mental formation, but also within the subtle body. And whatever arises, we shake hands with gently. Not trying to change the sensations. Just opening up space around them.
keep dropping in <clears throat> to the sensations. Dropping behind the thoughts, the stories, and just staying with the felt sensations of the body. Everything that enters your awareness can be examined through this subtle body. Maybe it's the sound of a barking dog in the background. Maybe it's a thought of something that happened today. Immediately notice what has shifted or changed in the body. You may notice an area that's particularly heavy or tight or aching. Without any agenda, turn your attention and awareness towards it. It may bring forth a story or tears. Create as much space as needed for whatever sensations are arising, unfolding, and dissipating. Each time you get caught up in a story, memory, or image and find yourself carried away, just relax, release whatever has captured your attention, and return with refreshed interest to noticing how this departure has impacted the sensations in the body.
If you feel disconnected or numb, it's hard to cultivate an intimacy with sensation in the body. You can do a little experiment, inviting yourself to bring forth an image or memory, something in which you can recall quite clearly feeling frustration. And only hold that memory in mind long enough to feel how it radiates through the body. And then release this memory or image and continue shaking hands, bringing full awareness and attention to the felt sensations in the body. And with just the most gentle shift, invite the attention and awareness of these sensations to be infused with a kindness, as though you were welcoming whatever sensations were arising. With the generosity and care of a host welcoming these sensations, as though they were your treasured guests.
keep bringing gentleness, friendliness, and kindness to the sensations. If the sensations have become subtle, bring kindness and gentleness towards that spacious, open feeling. Welcome back. Thank you, Eve. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Wow, that was good medicine. Thank you. <laughs> So exploring further this the relationship between the body and the subtle body. In the yogic traditions, both of India and of Tibet, which inherited the, the traditional practices from Mother India, uh, it's thought that on a basic level, there's the physical body, and then there's the subtle body, which is like the conduit or the bridge between the mind and the physical body. And so when the physical body is out of whack or there's been trauma or injury or illness, it affects the health of the subtle body, which is like the energy body. And then when the energy body or subtle body is imbalanced or uh, suboptimal due to physical ailment or illness, trauma, damage to the tissues, and so on, then the subtle body will affect the mental body, will affect the, the, the functioning of the mind and the, the feeling of ease or disease that we have. And so those three are related, the physical, the subtle, and the mental body. There are other systems that break it down into more detail, but that's a very simple and good way that's commonly described in, in the Tibetan yogas. And the interesting thing, I liked what um, Sokni Rinpoche said in the chapter on the subtle body, chapter 7. He said, essentially the subtle body is a kind of interface between the mind and the physical body, a means by which these two aspects of being interact. I'm on page 135 for the record, 135 at the bottom. A simple traditional image involves the relationship between a bell and a clapper. The little metal ball that strikes against the sides of the bell, that's the clapper. So the clapper represents a subtle body, the nexus of feelings while the bell represents the physical body. When the clapper hits the bell, the physical body, the nerves, the muscles, and organs, is affected and sound occurs. And I just happen to have a bell here. It's interesting, I'd actually never heard this, this description before, but this is a traditional Tibetan-style bell. 
and inside is the clapper. And so this is the subtle body. When it touches or hits or strikes the physical body, then sound resonates, vibration happens and sensation, sound, consciousness, you know, awareness can respond and happen along with that. And it's, it's true that it, if you, even just all of us, whether we're yogis or not, we can understand that, as he says, that the subtle body is like the home or like the abode, the dimension of the emotions. It's like the emotional body can be in there too. And oftentimes the, uh, when, the, when we have a strong emotion like heartbreak, we feel it in our heart. But like if you were to break open the body, you couldn't find heartbreak in there, right? It's a subtle occurrence, but it's there. And then so when we finally cry or let it out, there's a release. And then we have more access to the energy that was locked up in that knot of the subtle body. And so the Tibetan tradition does talk about that, that the subtle body is also where you can say that the emotional, the emotional body lives or the emotions live. And so meditation, but it's also yoga, helps to bring the physical body into optimal health, and that naturally influences the subtle body so that it's more fluid and circulating in a good way. And then naturally we have an ease of mind. Uh, the mind feels content. It's not agitated. He also tells a story later in the chapter about a student who came to him who was under a lot of deadlines, was doing a lot of work on the computer and so on during the day and then couldn't get his mind and body to settle for sleep and he just couldn't sleep. And Sogni Rinpoche said that that is a side effect of the subtle body being out of balance. In particular, the lung, which in, is, means prana in Sanskrit, the energy, is too much oftentimes when it's out of balance, it can get stuck in some place of the body. And when we tend to be thinking a lot or working a lot and under a lot of deadlines, computer work where we're using the eyes, and so on, the energy can get stuck in the upper body and cause imbalance, uh, vertigo, dizziness, headaches, insomnia. This is a sign, these are signs of, of imbalance of the prana or the lung, L-U-N-G, in the body. I had that, that thought, I, did, I had some thoughts during the meditation, just a few. <laughs> and one of them was funny, it made me chuckle actually, which I'll share with you is really like our culture, our modern culture is like, we're just like walking heads. You know, we're heads walking around. <laughs> we're so stuck up in the upper body, up in the head, right? All Everything we do, it's so heady, you know, it's elevated intellect. All, all of our, a lot of our ways of being are so centered around the intellect and the head. And it reminded me of one of my favorite bands in the 80s growing up, of course, was Talking Heads. <laughs> so I thought, oh, that could be a fun, funny name for another band, the Walking Heads. So anyway, we're just a bunch of walking heads. These are the great ideas that we have during our meditation practice. <laughs> a new band name, the Walking Heads. But we are, in a way, that in meditation, that practice that Eve wonderfully guided us through, helped me drop out of the walking head feeling and diffuse my mental energy, which is really the lung, the prana body, just stuck living kind of claustrophobic up in the head and drop down and embody the whole body, soles of the feet all the way up to the crown of the head. And that is a very uh, wonderful you can say byproduct of meditation practice as well as yoga and other internal arts. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what he shares in chapter 7 around the three aspects of this subtle body, the tsa, the lung, and the tigle, classic uh, triptych. And the tsa, which is a T-S-A, um, tsa is the Tibetan word for channels. In Sanskrit, it's nadi. So the channels are said to run through the body, and they say, oh, there's 72,000 channels. It's a way of saying there are a lot of channels in the body. <laughs> and out of all of these channels, uh, 
they say that they some texts will say, oh, 12 are of utmost important, or 13 are of utmost important. But out of those 13, there's really just three that are of the most importance. And out of those three, there's really just one <laughs> is primary. So the three are the central channel and then the two side channels. So those are the main tsa in the, in the body. And um, so you can guess out of those three what is the most important one. Yes, the central channel. <laughs> Because it's said that the two side channels are where the duality lives. So when our prana, the lung, is circulating in an imbalanced way, you can say, or just cycling through the two side channels, we're, we're cycling between the moon and the sun, or the day and the night, subject-object duality. There's the contrast. And the yogic practice is ultimately what they're bringing us to uh, realize is or to, to be able to facilitate is to bring those t the prana that runs along the two side channels into the central channel so that we can experience non-duality or oneness, samadhi, which means total, complete integration, meditative absorption, samadhi. So the anatomy is that the central channel begins at the crown of the head and runs along the front of the spine all the way down to the base where it ends in like a little bulb shape like a like a, a, a flower bulb at the base of the spine right at the perineum the, and it terminates at the top in a thousand petaled lotus sometimes it's called a ten thousand petaled lotus so many petaled lotus and that's the crown chakra right within the skull, the top of the skull. And then the two side channels begin, it's said, at the apertures of the nostrils and flow inside, up and around within the skull and then drop down parallel to the central channel on either side. And then they terminate into the central channel, actually, four finger widths below the navel. So everybody, you can take your four fingers and then find your navel and right below that, so four finger widths below the navel and then right in towards the center of the abdomen is where the side channels meet and hook in to the central channel. And so yogic practices uh, help us to bring balance the two side channels, the solar and the lunar, the yin and the yang within us and then consolidate the prana in the central channel. So if you've ever had an experience of total absorption of concentration, you could understand that or feel that as those side energies, the disparate energies in the body converging into the central channel. And sometimes that happens just kind of by accident. Like when you, if you have a lucky day, <laughs> just will happen to you. Other times it can come through tapas, you know, purifying practices and lots of sadhana, you know, that's the diligence and the discipline coming into play there. So that's the tsa and then there's the lung and lung is prana and the prana or the lung is what travels within the channels. And so when those, the prana is traveling smoothly then we feel at ease, we feel good, we feel balanced and at peace and content within ourselves. When the prana is not moving smoothly, we feel kind of antsy and agitated. Insom we get insomnia, we can't stop thinking. And um, the yoga practices help to unravel any knots that might be bound up within the channels through poor posture, through illness, through um, injury and so on, damage to the tissue can damage the subtle body as well in terms of it making knots within the subtle body, knots within the channels. So oftentimes the yogis will say, unravel the knots, you know, so the prana can then flow. And then the third is the tigle, which is very profound and has a lot of facets to it. The tigle is bindu in Sanskrit, and it means essence drop. 
or sometimes just drop. And that is the feeling of, uh, he, I like how Tsokni Rinpoche described it as a spark, sparks of life. He says, the channels are the means through which what we might call sparks of life, or tigle, move. In Tibetan, these sparks are called tigle, which may be translated as drops or droplets. An interpretation we're given so that we can form some kind of mental image of what passes through the channels. And it's said when the tigle is circulating through the channel, we experience great bliss. And even on a more subtle level, a very deep, deep advanced level, bodhicitta is that experience of bliss, of the tigles sparking. That's like on a subtle level. We think of bodhicitta as compassion, but ultimate bodhicitta is actually the nature of our own mind. And it's linked with that bliss that's held within this essence drop of the tigle. The tigle is like the pregnant zero that contains everything within it. It's a very profound teaching, the Tigle. And he also talks about these drops as uh, we can understand more in modern neuroscience as neurotransmitters. He says just below this on page 136 in the middle of 136, that nowadays, of course, we can begin to imagine these drops as neurotransmitters, the body's chemical messengers, that affect our physical, mental, and emotional states. Some of these neurotransmitters are fairly well known. For example, serotonin, which is, the, which is influential in depression. Dopamine, a chemical associated with the anticipation of pleasure. And epinephrine, more commonly known as adrenaline, a chemical often produced in response to stress, anxiety, and fear. Neurotransmitters are extremely small molecules, and while their effects on our mental and physical states can be quite noticeable, their passage between various organs of the body could still be called subtle. I had never heard that before, but I, it makes a lot of sense. It's a very beautiful understanding. And so that is, in a nutshell, the Tsa, the Lung, and the Tigle. Oftentimes the, the Tibetan yoga practice will be called Tsa Lung. Hmm. Yeah, Tsalung, because you're working with the channels and the winds, because prana also means wind. It's the motility factor within the body, and so we're balancing those so that then we can reach, you know, deeper states of awareness and healing. Yeah. So. Thank you, Chandra. Yeah. So welcome. beautiful. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for um, bringing us through the definitions <clears throat> so clearly and, and then tying it in to the, um, the aspect of this newer wisdom tradition, which is science, um, which for many of us is, is easier to understand. And, you know, you, when you and I were talking about this evening, um, I find it so funny that we feel safer thinking about central nervous system than we do thinking about our channels. Um, and so I think it's, you know, we can't feel our central nervous system, but we feel a sense of confidence that we have it. <laughs> we've seen enough data, um, we've seen enough research. And so, you know, I invite all of you to, to determine what resonates for you, what feels rich. Um, the most important part of exploring, especially our form body and our subtle body, um, is our first person experience as we did in our meditation practice mm -hmm. and really investigate. Oh, yeah. No, I'm sorry. I'm just yeah. feeling like after yeah. that, I would love to guide people through some breathing, just like a few minutes. Is that okay? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I I have, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I had I just two more things to say. Um, yes. and then I, yeah, good. And then, and then, um, and then no problem. Really just, yeah. um, one thing I really wanted to, um, share is that, um, you can have a real sense of kind of confidence and enjoyment in exploring the body. And so this idea that we're not asking you to perform a, a an esoteric experiment of the, 
this idea that our emotions are in our body or felt sensations are in the body, but in fact, that is the way we live through the world, um, that we are experiencing um, things that are enjoyable and fun, like in meeting with friends uh, at a safe distance, and then we're experiencing great pain and suffering, and that those actually have imprints in our body and our awareness and especially our kind attention to them is key. It really is an important aspect and that's how we can understand all of stress physiology. How do we work with those stresses that accumulate in our mind and then eventually actually find their way under our skin? Um, he, he really highlights the fact that the essence of mindfulness practice is appreciating the fact that we are alive. Um, that there's a joy that arises from this simple recognition, a sense of possibility, and a gut level connection to other beings. And because we're alive, we can make certain choices that affect not only our lives, but the lives of others. So even our embodied awareness helps us understand our impact in the world and, and our ethics. Awesome. Yeah, let's just, let's take some breaths. I want to share with you this breathing practice. It's very simple, called the jamlung. And it's a way to, to feel that space at the navel and drop out of the head and just spend like three minutes on this. Yeah, and so just make sure you're comfortable and we'll do a few, maybe five rounds of breathing just as a way to, to connect the dots of what was spoken into the body, into the physical experience. And this is something you can come back to anytime with your practice throughout your day. So just start to take some deep breaths into the abdomen and soften any tension of, with the breath as you exhale. The hands can rest on your thighs just like a normal meditation seat. This is usually done before you meditate as a way to get you in and to drop the thinking mind down into the body. So let's all take an out breath together, emptying completely. And then slowly inhale, draw the breath down into the belly. When you're full, Hold the breath in and then let the belly soften out like you've got a pumpkin in your belly. And then pull up from the perineum, a little lift at the base of the torso. Holding for a few counts and then when you're ready, exhale, let the breath out nice and slow. Relax the jaw, the face, the neck, the shoulders. Again, inhale, a count of three to five as you breathe in. Let the belly expand forward and out a bit. Hold it. Lift up at the base as if you're trying not to pee. It's like a little lift, a gentle upward flow. And then feel a little downward packing down from above, like at the solar plexus, like you're packing the energy in the navel. And then when you need to, you just gently let the breath out, moving at your own pace, three to five counts. Inhale again. Hold the breath in, let the belly expand and soften, soften the kidneys, lift at the perineum, and then a gentle downward flow from above. So it's like you're packing the energy at the navel center where those two channels meet the central channel. And then exhaling nice and slow. We'll do two more rounds like that. This is called the jamlung, the gentle breath. So let it be gentle, inhaling nice and slow. <clears throat> Hold the breath in when you're full. You can do a little lock of the chin, a little downward flow with the chin to lock the air in, pull up from the base, press down from above, pack that energy in right at the navel center. And then gently exhale. So 
softening tension. Last round, nice and slow inhale. Hold the breath in. Lock the chin gently. Let the belly soften. Lift up at the perineum, closing the lower doors. And then press down right below the solar plexus. Gentle, compact feeling at the navel, but no tension. And then when you need to, exhale nice and slow. Take a breath or two here, just feeling the natural flow of the breath, the after effect. Soften the mental energy down into the body. Feel the lung, the winds moving more freely within you. And then coming back to the space and noticing how you feel. Maybe you feel a little different, a little quieter, a little calmer, more spacious. You may have felt a little compactness at the belly, a little consolidation of your prana down there, maybe a little tickling, a little warmth, the navel center. Good, so that's, that's it, yeah, Mace, <laughs> you got some heat, yeah, good, that's the beginning of the tumo, the inner heat, that's a preliminary breath for this inner kundalini practice we do in the Tibetan yoga, it's called tumo, it means chandali, the inner heat, so I just, I'm sorry Eve for interrupting you, that was such a faux pas, or a po fa. So I apologize for my pofa, but I got, I got, I was like, I just talked about Tsalung Tigle and I didn't give them an experience of it, you know, I felt like I would have, would have been remiss. Beautiful. So that's a little taste. Great. And um, again, I'm, I'm having some, uh, I, I don't have internet on my computer and so I can't see what's in the chat. Um, I, I'm not sure what's happening there, uh, and yeah. not sure if there's a thing we want to respond to right now. Um, but also, um, we are hoping to do breakout groups, but not sure if that is a possibility for us tonight. So, Katie yeah. and Mace, I want it is, yeah, yeah. Katie okay, says great. yes. Great. Um, so our hope would be to give you all time in this breakout group to reflect on um, this subtle body experience, and. We are living through <laughs> historic times, right? Very, um, very challenging times. And I do think that um, as someone I did see when it popped up mentioned this, this book by Vessel, um, Vessel van der Kolk, The Body Keeps the Score. So from the trauma point of view, from the psychological research, we see that there is a somatic experience of the stress, the emotional stress. Of this, of this time. And so our hope for you in this group is that you have a chance to really reflect on and share what has been your embodied experience. It's so hard for us to recall. So I invite you to just think of today. <laughs> um, today is usually a um, amount of time that we have reasonably good recall. So you can think of, do you remember what the body felt like first thing in the morning? Do you remember how that shift and changed through different events of the day? Interactions with other people, time with your own mind and thoughts. And so to be truly reflective and curious about what has it been like to be in your subtle body today. Um, and again, I, I hope that it doesn't feel too far away to think about this idea of subtle body. You don't have to be a very advanced practitioner of Vajrayana Buddhism to feel your subtle body. You simply have to be aware of what it's like when you feel frustrated, <laughs> what it's like when you feel longing. It's not just a mental experience. It's an embodied experience. And the invitation here is to really deeply notice and be curious about those shifts. Um, we want to give you enough time. We know there's never enough time. So we will give you 15 minutes. Um, I know that people leave when there's group. Oh, I already see many people leaving. That's okay. For those who are staying, 
um, I really invite you to consider the important role of spiritual friendship. What happens when we are in connection with one another um, and how meaningful it is to uphold for one another a bearing witness. So this is not a time in which you will give each other advice or fix one another. Um, this is also not a time in which you maybe share the hardest things of what's happening to you. What we're inviting you to do is actually to bear witness for one another as a form actually of contemplation. So you're sharing about your body and your experience, um, but without necessarily needing feedback um, of any particular kind. Um, so I, I hope that that's clear, that this isn't a, a process group. This is really a mode for us to be curious and recognize the interdependence of our feeling by hearing from others as well. Yeah. We were talking in our small group about the lung, this upward energy, um, and also the experience of just total depletion when we're cut off from our subtle body or when we have blockages and um, just deep exhaustion. Um, you know, one, one thing that Sokni mentions in, um, in his chapter is it's really interesting when he's talking about the body and, and movement. <clears throat> I think most of us associate um, being mindful of our body with moving very slowly at like a physical level. Like we're just, everything is slowed down. We're really mellow. And, <clears throat> you know, he says that we actually don't need to be slow in order to be mindful of our bodies, that we can have a very clear intention and move quite quickly. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, um, be speaking with him about this idea of that busy people can't be mindful because they have too much to do. And he really kind of completely contradicted that and just said, absolutely not. You can be very busy and remain soft in the belly. Mm -hmm. So moving around the world rapidly, getting a lot done, but not contracting, um, not kind of pushing um, in that difficult way. And I thought that was quite useful. So yeah. Other folks have thoughts, reflections, questions about subtle body practice, about what you learned from one another in your group. You can chat uh, any questions into the chat function and we're happy to, to answer those. Yeah. With our smaller group, I'd even hazard folks if they'd like to raise a hand and share something pithy with us. And asks us, where do the five aggregates fit in? I was taught that we are composed of these. Ooh, yeah, really good... that's a great question. That kind of, kind of popped in my head as I was talking earlier. We're, we're, mm. we're on the same wavelength. <laughs> so the five aggregates are form, feeling, perception, volitional action, like your karmic imprints, and then consciousness. And so it is like a, the triptych and then the, the five model of the five aggregates can be overlaid to a certain degree because the physical body is really form, is the first of the five aggregates. The five aggregates, the form aggregate is made up of the five elements, you know, earth, fire, water, air, and space. And then air is in there. So lung is very much connected with air. So you can find that even just within the form of the first aggregate. And then the second one, feeling, is the, the experience we have because we've taken form, right? Because we're in a body, we feel things. We come into contact with things, we feel them. And so that can also be associated with the subtle body because of the way that it's taught is that it's the feeling body, really. It's where the emotions live, but also our feelings of, of mm. like sensations, perhaps. You know, I, I would say that my understanding is that uh, the emotion feeling, the emotion is more subtle body within the subtle body. Feelings like sensation feelings. Uh, physiological feelings rather than psychological feelings are more um, gross body in a physical body. Uh, 
So then there's, but there's that. And then the perception is the third of the five aggregates. And that's like, okay, we come into contact with things. Like we, we, mm. we feel something like I feel the hot stove. Then my perception because of my nerves and my physical form and the feeling contact there, I perceive it as hot. Ouch. Take it off. It's mm. unpleasant. So I move away from unpleasant. I move towards pleasant. And then I'm, you know, kind of remain neutral within the neutral sensation. So that's the perception. How do we perceive things? And then karmic volition is the karmic seeds that we bring from life to life. Why do we like hot? Do we not like cold? What is our maybe genetic karmic imprints, but also psychic, uh, spiritual genet uh, uh, imprints? So those that's the fourth of the five skandhas or the five uh, aggregates and then the fifth is consciousness and we're not talking like rigpa here in this framework of like absolute pristine consciousness awareness it's more like because you're in a body because you've got a nervous system and a, uh, everything else you are conscious we are conscious human beings a frontal lobe whatever it is that makes you know animals though too everything that is a sentient or a semchen that has a, a mind semchen means mind haver is conscious so those are the five aggregates, and um, I, so I think we're more playing in the domain of gross and subtle and lung, so the, yeah, the gross body here and the emotional body. Yeah, that's the kind of off the top of my head answer. It's not a question I've ever gotten and I haven't actually learned. That's my interpretation, so I hope that was interesting. Mm, very. You know, I think occasionally we can get um, ourselves even within a single tradition into schema soup, right? Yeah, it's kind of and, schema soup. Yeah. And so that, that's, <laughs> that's totally okay. And um, I really appreciate um, Walt's question, which is a different, it's when we have not only within a tradition schema soup, but we have a cross tradition schema soup. So Walt says, I'm not yogic, but my wife very much is. I find it difficult to center on somatic centers, which can't be physically identified. But from a neuroscience standpoint, I find much common ground. She's a poet. I guess I'm not. Um, and I really need to benefit from her perspective. And, you know, I think that there's a very um, happy and harmonious medium here. Um, a bit less from the neuroscientific perspective, per se, just with subtle body, and a bit more from the psychophysiology perspective. And so with neuroscience, of course, what we're measuring are uh, neural activities, often neural networks, um, different ways in which um, our behaviors, intentions, our uh, not our thoughts, but our, um, our impulses can be assessed through um, fMRI. Katie can tell you a lot more about that. Um, but when we talk about psychophysiology, what we're really talking about is measuring the kind of, actually, what is sometimes called gross, but actually is kind of more subtle arousal of the body into a feeling of excitation. And we can really see uh, very clearly that our emotions create physiological change in the body. And so if it, it's easier to um, understand that at a level, again, of autonomic nervous system arousal and over arousal, there's nothing wrong with having an emotional response and feeling it in the body. I think when we look at um, what are called subtle body um, blockages, what we often see in the psychological literature is this idea that we have an over arousal of our stress and it sends signals that then uh, that kind of invite us to have this fight flight freeze response towards everything and then we get what is often kind of described as this cascade of cortisol and other hyper vigilant um, aspects of our emotional response and so it's interesting, we can think of that as the, the lung and the high wind energy, or we can think of that as our, our survival, like overacting. And, and these are probably not exactly the same. But again, remembering that uh, the you know, historically informed evidence of contemplative practice and then the um, randomized control trialed evidence of scientific practice both involve observation, but they're observing with different tools. So observing by either really feeling the body and, and kind of trying to notice and parse the mind or using highly refined instruments to measure the heat of your skin, to measure the rate of your heart and respiration. So they're gonna have slightly different outcomes, but we're measuring the same phenomena. 
Our, when we are emotional, we have experiences. When we block those emotional experiences, a lot of trouble ensues. <laughs> That's the bottom line. So thank you for that question. Um, we are almost out of time, but let me just see here. Oh, Deborah's asking about five aggregates. So much great reading. Chandra, do you, do you recommend any reading for her to um, follow up on? I see that Katie shared a link and I'm not familiar oh, with that link, but I would trust it's pretty good. You could Google and find with Guru Google many profound teachings. <laughs> uh, maybe even Wikipedia will have a nice concise uh, summary of the five aggregates in Buddhism, five skandhas, S K. H A N D A S. That means like the mm -hmm. unpoetic translation of that is the five heaps, <laughs> which is <laughs> not appealing. But it's basically the Buddha taught that these that we are a conglomeration of these five aspects. That we're no solid existing self, but we're empty of separate existence or um, permanent existence. But we're actually like I like the way Thich Nhat Hanh talks about it as five tributaries of the five skandhas coming together for a period of time to make mm. a river that is I. Thich mm. Nhat Hanh has some good texts on the Heart Sutra that you could um, look up and I love the way he talks about these teachings. So essence, mm. so heartfelt and deep. Thich Nhat Hanh has books about on the Heart Sutra, you find teachings on the five skandhas in there with his commentary. Mm. Beautiful. And that reminds me that, you know, Sukhni um, tells us that when we are in, let's say, um, healthy connection with our subtle body, when we are aware, when we're not blocking, that there's the natural openness and warmth of our presence, our loving presence. So if you remember, he describes our innate nature as having these qualities of warmth, of clarity, um, and we can really access that, our, our, our natural birthright, essentially who we are, if we are not blocked, if we are not obstructed. And a lot of the obstructions he names as part of trying to keep hold on this identity project, creating our sense of I over and over and over. And that that kind of blocks out important information and focuses unnecessarily on others. So once again, back to this identity project of making me me which is, it's so funny that the less we can adhere to a sense of self, the happier we are. I don't know if you guys ever follow the literature on that, but ego dissolution and feeling of subjective well-being are very highly connected. <laughs> so it's um, that natural warm presence really is available to us um, as well. So yeah, I think, um, Chandra, I'd love if you would lead us in a dedication and um, just so wonderful for, to hear from you all and be with you all. And thank you for hanging through the groups. Um, we, we want to give people the opportunity to connect with one another and, and recognize it's, it's a bit to ask in this online format. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, as the me, me, me uh, kind of dissolves away, we, we experience this subjective well-being. I love the way you articulated that in such a poetically scientific way. <laughs> no one does it quite like you, Eve. Um, yeah, so that it's a spaciousness, right? It's like the thinking we're contained within this clay pot of the body, but then when that shell breaks, when we have a moment of realization we we realize that we are one with with everything that the space within the pot and the space outside of the pot are not different mm. so it's an illusion so that's why we suffer because it's not aligned with reality this separateness this small sense of self and so as we dedicate we dedicate in that spacious open oceanic potential of offering any positive merit that we have cultivated as a sangam here in this period of time in our virtual dimension for the benefit of all beings everywhere, like a drop of water entering the vast ocean of positive energy becomes limitless, so we offer it up, and in that way it becomes infinite. May all beings be well, may they be safe, free from harm, free from oppression, 
free from bondage and free from delusion and hatred. May we all be free of suffering and its causes. May all beings experience the bliss, the tigle, the ultimate bodhicitta of their true nature. And come home to themselves through that. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with everybody. Mm. So Lisa. next week we'll do Feeding Your Demons. So yes. I'll be here next week and we'll do Feeding Your Demons. So bring it, bring whatever you want. We can, <laughs> we can every, it's all, they're all welcome. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll guide you through the process. And then the following uh, Wednesday, Eve and I will come back together and continue with the book. Mm -hmm. And reminding all of you, with your generosity to please support the Dharma Collective so we can all continue to be here together and check out the schedule. Just amazing, 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 amazing things happening all the time. Um, so yeah, and if you wanna unmute to say farewell, farewell, so happy. Long. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>